I was living on the Air Force Academy in 1977 when the first women cadets were welcomed as duallys to Jacks Valley and the campus. I couldn't wait to go up the hill and watch the transition. That fall, there was great elation that women had entered this very man's world. But also, there were some doubts. I am so glad that I was there to experience this historic event firsthand. Of course, not nearly as firsthand as the women who were the female cadets. Today, I'm privileged to introduce one of those amazing pioneer women. Michelle Johnson, cadet, was not among the women of the first class, however, was one of the women among the second class. And I am sure that she will tell you how the academy was not yet accustomed to having women when Cadet Johnson put on her uniform. In 1978 was the beginning of an illustrious career for this awesome lady. This awesome pilot, this awesome athlete, and this awesome general. I am positive that everyone in this room has read about her accomplishments. Although she fell one year shy of being the, in the first graduating class with women from the academy, she is the first woman cadet wing commander, the first woman Rhodes Scholar from the academy, and the first Department of Defense woman superintendent of a service academy. She is quoted as saying, you need to have your confidence come from your competence. Integrity matters. I am passing on this memorable statement to you folks here today and also to my grandchildren. Our speaker is here today to tell you about her decisions, her steps, and her passions as she progressed from young girl to cadet to wife and mother of twin boys to general and all in between. This year is the 60th anniversary of the Air Force Academy, and today it is commonplace, it is established, it is humanistic to have the gender equity at our historic military academies. One of the reasons is women like our speaker today, a woman who can fit in and a woman who can stand out simultaneously. Pillar is extremely proud and humble to introduce today's esteemed pearl of wit and wisdom. Please welcome Lieutenant General Michelle D. Johnson, Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy. That was lovely. That was lovely. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a, privilege to, it's a privilege to be here, and uh, Bea was very kind, and I appreciate that very much. And uh, today, I'll have a, I'd love to talk more about the Academy, but I, I'll, I'll take a more of a personal approach if I could. But we'd like to start it out, if, uh, if we may, uh, with something you might have seen on TV that, with the Air Force is running, just to show you who American airmen really are. So Major Field, if you'd run that, please. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Nicole Malachowski and I'm the commander of the 333rd Fighter Squadron. Day to day I'm responsible for ensuring the mission of the 333rd Fighter Squadron, which is to train up the next generation of F-15 aircrew. So I've got about 50 officers enlisted and civilian that work with me to get that mission done. When I was five, I went to an air show. I remember looking my father in the eye and saying, I want to be a fighter pilot someday. Choosing the Air Force Academy for me was the smoothest, most direct path to achieving that dream. I headed off to pilot training a few months after graduation uh, at Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. You know, I wanted to be an officer, I wanted to fly fighters. I didn't realize all the opportunities that were out there. By the time I made the decision to apply for the Thunderbirds, I had been in three operational fighter squadrons. I'd certainly deployed into combat. I truly had no idea that they had not had a woman Thunderbird pilot at the time I had applied. I used to always bristle a little bit at the thought of being called a woman fighter pilot or being called the woman Thunderbird pilot. I realized it means something to see someone who looks like you succeeding. So if me wearing that Thunderbird uniform inspires young girls to follow their dreams, whatever it is, 
then I'll tell you what, that is no doubt absolutely a humbling feeling. My relationship with the WASP, or the Women Air Force Service Pilots, goes back to when I was about 12 years old. My parents took me on a trip to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and there was this very small display on these women who had been flying military aircraft back in World War II. Then I fast forward to this time when I'm a Thunderbird, and as I go towards the autograph line, there's this group of three or four older women wearing the telltale blue scarves of the WASP. To me, they're like rock stars. And because of everything that they did 60 years prior, I was able to have this opportunity. And they had been standing there all day in the autograph line to get my autograph. And they stood there and they're like, you're our hero. And I thought, how backwards is this interaction right now? Can I have your autograph? Every day I'm pretty surprised by what the Air Force lets me do. I was selected to be a White House fellow. I worked for basically six months under President Bush and six months under President Obama. It was unbelievable. I was able to witness history up close and personal. I've now been in the Air Force more than half my life. You know, you blink and you realize, wow, how did I go from the lieutenant here 14 years ago to the commander 333rd Fighter Squadron? To know that you are a part of a team like this to know that you are serving your country and to know that you're a part of something so much bigger than yourself, that is reward in and of itself. In this Air Force, there really are opportunities for everybody. As long as you apply yourself and you're a team player and you keep a positive attitude, you have no idea what opportunities or doors that are gonna open. When I came to the Academy, I did come in 1976 um, and so uh, graduated in, I came in 77, I should say, and B had that right, and I graduated in 1981, and so things have changed a lot since then. But I thought I'd tell sort of a personal story to sort of let you know who we are better, and maybe that helps uh, flesh out your impressions of the Academy and of our Air Force. All of us have our own story, and uh, mine started in Iowa. I was, uh, my dad had uh, been a farmer, I moved to town, and then he worked for a farm service company. We actually lived in Illinois for a little while. That picture's in Illinois. But um, I was sort of a rural latchkey kid, and so I was home alone, uh, left to my own devices out in the country. So I would sneak down the road about a quarter of a mile where there was this pasture, not with this horse, but with a different one, uh, and I would trespass, basically, and ride the horse. I would lure him over to the fence and try to, to ride him. And he'd, I'd go a few steps and then he'd throw me off. And, and I did that for, I got away with that for some weeks until finally he really threw me once and I was, had a lot, enough lacerations that when I was nine or 10 years old that, you know, moms notice these things at bath time. <laughs> and they, since she said, well, how did you do that? And I, I said, well, I went down the road and rode that horse. And, and they said, oh, you know, in my family, mom and dad, we're a tough crowd. They lived through the Depression on a farm in Iowa, so they may not have always articulated their core values this way, but it was very clear. Don't lie, do your best, and don't bother other people, which kind of goes with the Air Force core values. Integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all you, in all you do. So that was a natural for me. But in the don't bother other people, I had grossly violated that. So, <laughs> so they, they dragged me down the road by the scruff of the neck to apologize to the Kane family. And, this was in Illinois, and this, the family actually commuted to Chicago uh, from the country, so they weren't around their farmstead very much. And we didn't really know them, um, so little me went to the door, and the couple came up, and I said, I am very sorry for trespassing and riding your horse without permission. And they looked at me, and they looked at each other, and they looked at me, and they said, you can ride Stormy? <laughs> and I go... Stormy, you know, well, he's blind in one eye, so he would shy at anything, and that's why he was throwing me off. He had cockleburs in his mane, and nobody paid attention to him, but he had a beautiful meadow. And, uh, and so they said, well, wow, you can come and ride him any time you want. And, uh, and, and so I thought that was kind of a cool break. So here are the lessons I drew from that. Take a chance, do your best, hang tough, and it's going to come out okay. So in addition to getting to Red Stormy, Mom and Dad bought me, okay, you can, if you can bring up 
This is Babe, the Morgan mare that my dad bought me so she could be in the pasture with Stormy. So what was my, my lesson was, you know, take a chance and hang tough, and it's going to turn out OK. So maybe that was ingrained in my head as I went through life. And I was a, an athlete in high school. Uh, in Iowa, the schools are really good. We went back to Iowa. Um, I went to high school in Spencer, Iowa, up in the northwest corner, almost in Minnesota. And uh, I was a 4.0 student. I was a National Merit Scholar. And I was an all-state basketball player. And uh, we were state champs in track we, as a hurdler and a sprinter. So uh, it was a wonderful thing. But mom and dad didn't have much experience with college. So, and it wasn't the time when it was cool to be a woman athlete back in the 70s, right? People wondered about that. They weren't so sure. And uh, it was natural for me because I grew up this way riding horses and running around and helping dad, you know, I baled hay and, you know, fed cattle and those kinds of things that you do uh, to work. So, uh, but the, the nation didn't necessarily have that set up and it didn't have a lot of recruiters for basketball. Back in Iowa those days, we played six player basketball. So I played offense. And so I'd score, I sometimes scored 40 and 50 points a game because I was a pretty good shooter, but um, I didn't get recruited to the big colleges with the five player game. So, I went to a career day at our high school and an Air Force liaison officer came in and talked about the opportunities at the Air Force Academy and that President Ford had signed legislation in 1975 to open up that opportunity. And I thought to myself, this is a chance to serve, to get a good education, to maybe play uh, sports as well, and then go through a really challenging program, sort of an outward bound thing to test myself as a person. So while I would have served and then as a, in my later life, I can go on and do other things. Didn't really know much about the military. Dad had um, been briefly enlisted in the Navy during World War II, but by the timing of the war and, and everything, he really didn't uh, have to carry through with that. So I went to the, to the Air Force Academy in, in early days, and, and people were struggling with it. You know, uh, it was a bit of a shock to go from being that little girl that could go down and ride horses and be treated as an equal and get good grades in school and play sports to have people say, What's wrong with you for being here, right? And then if you're successful, that makes you even more weird, right? Just because, wow, and if you can succeed, then there must really be something wrong with you. And I didn't understand that. I didn't think anything was wrong with me. Um, but I tried to live the brochure. I tried to live the brochure. So we can go to the next uh, pictures if I could. So I played basketball here. And uh, we had less than 300 women here for the first couple of years. So. When we played, even playing Division II, it was before women were in the NCAA, we played in the AIAW, they called it. We went to nationals a couple times, and I was an academic All-American, and uh, we did really well, actually. But it was just starting the program, so that was younger me. That's uh, me walking around as a cadet, because I was a cadet wing commander, and I did get a Rhodes Scholarship, and I was the top graduate in operations research, and I was the most valuable scholar-athlete, and, I, and uh, it was, I had a pretty good go. Take a chance, do your best, hang tough, and it will come up roses. Uh, people were pretty ugly. It was shocking how ugly people are about change. Uh, they act out on change. If you don't look the way they expect you to, if you don't sound the way they expect you to, it's really ugly. And it was, uh, it was really shocking. Um, these days, with this generation, now that I'm the superintendent, with this generation of millennials, they're more open. They're much more open. Diversity is a different idea. But they're still human, and they still have those challenges of growing up. And they come from all across the country, 1,200 new people. We had 1,206 new cadets come in this summer, and they come from all across the country where maybe everybody doesn't have the same outlook. And maybe they aren't so open to different people. So we have to help them understand that the United States Air Force uh, answers to the Constitution. We respect each other. We respect whether it's your faith or your or your ethnicity, or your orientation, or anything, that's what we do, and that's who we are. So uh, it's a lesson that's not easily learned always, but that's, that's uh, a Im terribly important one. And you see, read about it too much in the papers, because it's a fine line. I hope you'll take away that there are good people out there. I'm just, maybe you'll know more about me. Um, they're mostly good people. Sometimes the headlines steal our narrative, and I want you to believe there's a good people trying to be good leaders, and I have as well. So what a great experience at the academy, and I was, uh, it was a really successful run. So I went to Oxford University for two years after the academy and uh, did politics and economics uh, there, and then I went to pilot training at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. 
And unlike Major Malika oh, Colonel Malakowski, Nicole, I know, I wrote her a note uh, when she went to be in the Thunderbird. She was the first woman Thunderbird. And I sent her a note and said, hey, I have not been a Thunderbird, but I've been first at a few things. And, uh, and it's hard sometimes. But just don't let people make you feel alone, because you're not alone. The, the Air Force is a team sport. Uh, operations are a team sport. And the more you stay together with your brother Thunderbirds, uh, the better. And it was kind of funny, because it took a while for her to answer me back. And then she wrote me a note back and said, I didn't know it was you. I, I'd never met her, but I'm like a historic relic at the academy. <laughs> so, so she kind of knew. But I've kept up with Nicole, and she has twin sons as well. And uh, her husband is a wonderful, a wonderful guy, a navigator, or a backseater, Sizzo uh, now. But, uh, but she, she had people say pretty shocking things to her, too. You know? and, uh, and she just said when she'd be up there ready to do the maneuver, thinking about someone saying a hateful thing as she walked to her jet. She said, you know, I'm up here in my F-16, and you're eating your funnel cake down there, so <laughs> I think we're doing okay. So after, uh, after pilot training, and back then we could, women could fly tankers, trainers, or transports, and I had been in school for so long, I really wanted to do an operational mission. This is the Cold War, so I, I was in 1984, sort of flying. So if we can go to the next one, please. So I was a C-141 pilot, which is a four-engine jet transport, and so what I did... Up, I was much younger then, and then I did some other things I'll tell you about, but I, uh, I flew around the world from Charleston, South Carolina, and I flew uh, Africa, Middle East, South America, uh, Europe, a little bit in the Pacific, and it was a great mission. So it was myself as a mid-20s person with crews of, you know, four to 12 people, most of which were old enough to be my father, and uh, we went places before GPS, you know, when you really had to navigate, and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, find your way around the world is a great, great leadership test. And you had great adventures there doing that. So on one particular mission, I was assigned a brand new pilot to the squadron to go to Jordan for a month for an exercise. And he'd been a flight test engineer, so he was late to flying. And we went out to uh, fly around in, in Jordan and fly, flew up the Gulf of Aqaba several times in this exercise. And, and one of the times we landed there, there were a bunch of uh, soldiers on the ground and some angry colonels. We were captains, they were colonels, and the colonels were mad because their C-5 broke. And if anybody has experience in the Air Force, you know that this is not uncommon for a C-5 to have challenges. And so it was stuck in Germany, and, and I said to my co-pilot, go in and file the flight plan and do that pilot stuff, and I'll, I'll handle the colonels and, uh, and the soldiers, and then we'll be able to go on. And, and we did, and I called on the high-frequency radio to Germany to find out where their plane was, and got them taken care of and said, okay. And then co-pilot came back and said, I said, okay, let's go. And he said, we can't go. Well, why can't we go? Because the, the tower controller in Aqaba, Jordan, heard your voice on the radio, and he won't give us takeoff clearance until you come up and have tea with him. <laughs> so, so we went up and uh, had tea. And in the Middle East, you need this really strong tea with the mint and the sugar and everything. And he was very gracious, and it was a nice chat. And, uh, and we took off and didn't think anything of it. And uh, I came back to the States, and I went to a school in Alabama, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And that was back with snail mail, no email, you know. I got this letter from the tower controller in Aqaba, Jordan. It was about three pages long. It's hard to read it, but it was a list of stuff. It was like household goods and then livestock on the last page. And the last thing said 24 horses. So I had a thing for horses, you know. And I called up my dad, who was still alive then. I said, Dad, on a good day, I'm worth 24 horses. It was an offer, because <laughs> it was an offer. And my, <laughs> and then my very practical dad asked me, he goes, well, honey, what kind of horses? <laughs> you know? so, so I think it was hilarious. Now, by that point, I'd started actually dating that person who had been my co-pilot. And his name was John Hargraves, who I met on July 17th, 1987. And uh, I sent him this letter, which I thought was hilarious. I didn't make a copy. I didn't have a computer to scan it in. Big mistake, because he didn't think it was very funny. And uh, he tore it and threw it away. But I married him three years later anyway. <laughs> but I said, I still don't have any horses. So that's a problem. But anyway, so my, my husband and I have been married 24 years this, this summer. Our kids are 11, so you can see that we lived apart a lot. And this is what military families go through. We lived apart, literally completely apart, for seven of the first 13 years of our marriage. And that's sort of normal um, in the drill. And it's hard, especially this last decade, for the younger 
folks, the, the expeditionary wars we've had, the strains on military families. And so that explains why I'm so old and my kids are so young. <laughs> but we're so, we're so blessed to have them and it's just a wonderful thing. Um, I managed to command, I commanded a squadron level, two or 300 people in squadrons. The group level, 800 to 1,000 people in groups. Um, I was a wing commander in Kansas. I uh, had almost 4,000 people in my command then, and I flew, I've flown the jets in Air Mobility Command. So the Air Force missions are global vigilance or in, um, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, rapid global mobility, which is what I was part of, airlift and air refueling, and then global power, so fighters and bombers and missiles. So um, I flew the jets in AMC, so I flew C-141s, KC-10s, which are jumbo, uh, tankers and, and transports, C-5s, which are the jumbo uh, uh, transports, and I see a mentor of mine along the way here, Gene Corbett, so you can correct me to 100% on this stuff. But, uh, but, uh, and then I commanded a, a KC-135 wing. But um, miraculously, my husband and I had actually had a chance to live together for a couple of years by the time I was a wing commander in Kansas, which really helps should be able to have kids. So, <laughs> I know. I know this because my initials are MD. But, um, but anyway, so I had, I had the boys uh, in Wichita uh, in the end of 2002, and my husband hit 20 years then and retired. So that's how our family survives, is my husband's retired Eagle Scout, outward bound, VMI, electrical engineer, pilot, and dad. And so John keeps us together all the time. I'm gonna go through this last bit pretty quickly because I have to throw myself on your mercy. I've got a bit of a, a crunch right now with the Pentagon, and I've got to go have a phone call with the Secretary of the Air Force right after I stop talking. So that's why I'm going to be kind of brief. And I, I've already talked to her this morning, and I've got to do it again later. So you have to bear with me. But um, I had the chance, I, after, when I was flying, after I was a captain, and this is when the Corbett's were, and uh, Jean and Sue really were mentors of mine when I was a captain, I had a chance to come back and teach at the academy. But then after that, I became the, the Air Force aide to President Bush 41 and President Clinton. That means I carried the nuclear codes. So I went wherever the president went from 92 to 94. And uh, again, one of our separations, our marital separations, but what a great opportunity as a, as a young officer and a citizen. So that's on Air Force One with President Bush. And that's with the National Sports Awards with President Clinton. And that's Arthur Ashe's widow accepting the, Nash, the Presidential Medal of uh, Freedom. Uh, from him. So my mom was really upset because he didn't say my name. He just said, my military aide will read the citation. And I called home and mom said, why didn't he say your name? I said, mom, it wasn't about me. So uh, that's why it's hard for me to talk to you about this because it really is none of this is about me. It's about everyone else. So we'll go to the next one, please. And uh, we just wanted to show you some pictures. So this is the boys when I was a wing commander at, uh, at McConnell Air Force Base in Kansas. And uh, so John would just drag them around all the spouse meetings and the Ladies welcomed us in. This was last summer when I took command out at the Air Force Academy. So that's Mitchell and Preston and John Hargraves who are, who are how I survive. So in between wing command, I've had all these senior staff jobs. I was at transportation command. I uh, was the head of public affairs for the Air Force. And I was on the joint staff, not necessarily in that order. Um, when I was at uh, Transportation Command, I started, we helped start the Northern Distribution Network through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and to Af Afghanistan. So I was on the road a lot around the globe. When I was on the Joint Staff J5, we started Cyber Command, and my staff and I wrote the memo that Secretary Gates signed to start Cyber Command. So you can see that even though I was a pilot, really, as you get more senior and become a general officer, and many of you, you know this, you really become a general officer and be able to lead large organizations and to do it in a way that's uh, joint with the other services, coalition, international, and then also national. So in my weird eclectic experience, I think it's helped prepare me to be the superintendent. But the thing is, uh, your Air Force Academy is strong. Uh, there have been things that have happened that, that we wanna do better. Uh, but when you get a chance to go talk to these young people, uh, the 997 that have graduated from the class of 2014, and you see the great things that they're doing, they're capable of, uh, you'd be really proud, and I want you to be proud of that. And uh, we're instilling strong values, and uh, what, really trying to work on commitment to the core values of the nation, and that's really hard, because peer pressure is powerful, but the values of the nation, the core values, and to have people be brave enough to take a chance, to hang tough, and have it come out okay. And so, 
for this kid who was a farmer's daughter from Iowa to have had this amazing journey for 37 years has been really extraordinary. And I just want to leave you with, uh, with something that I think about when I face something that is daunting. It's a quote, it's, a t it's attributed to Edward Teller or Jan Le Van Zandt or to other people, but I think about it a lot. And it is this, when we come to the end of all the light that we know and are about to step off into the darkness, faith is knowing that one of two things is gonna happen. Either there will be something solid in the darkness for us to stand on, or we'll learn how to fly. And that's how it works. So thanks very much. And we, we might have a second for questions if you want. So thank you.